There have been 24 failed COPs, one partially successful one, Paris Agreement, um, 2015. This shows every sign at the moment of being the 25th failed one. Now, normally, when you fail and keep failing, you try something different. Um, one of the definitions of madness is doing the same thing repeatedly and expected, expecting a different result. And they're just banging their heads against the wall, doing the same thing as they've always done. And so you have to ask yourself, why? You know, are they really that stupid? Do they really think that a process which has failed so often will suddenly miraculously succeed using exactly the same methods as before? And you begin to suspect, no, they can't be that stupid. And that sense is reinforced by the fact that the one absolutely fundamental, central, crucial issue, which is leaving fossil fuels in the ground, has never been properly discussed at one of these meetings. And so you begin to ask, well, you know, is this actually failure by design? And I'm not saying, you know, the devious committee of people sit down and say, right, how can we make sure that we screw up? But I'm saying that if they were serious about this, if they really meant it, if they really sought to ensure that we do not face systemic environmental collapse, in other words, the collapse of our life support systems, they would have done it differently by now. Everything would have been different by now. There would have been different processes, but much more importantly, there would have been a different focus. And the focus would have been relentlessly, until you have done it, on leaving fossil fuels in the ground. The fact that they've not done that suggests that there are so many things standing between them and that goal that the goal might scarcely exist. And what do you make of in interventions by people like Angela Merkel, Barack Obama, people who over the last 10, 20 years have wielded extraordinary power and who are now making appeals to school children to turn the political dial. Mm. What does that tell us about political leadership on climate and, and political leadership more generally in the 21st century? Isn't it interesting how politicians um, suddenly see the light once they've left office? Um, and, and we see this repeatedly. We saw it with Al Gore as well, who, you know, who's actual negotiation record and record as vice president was really not good, but suddenly becomes a great climate champion when, when he ceases to be in that position. And of course, part of what it tells you is that when you're in power, you are subjected to massive lobbying and that all too often those in power are prepared to succumb to that lobbying. You, you can see a lot of it, especially with Obama. You know, he didn't want to do the things he did, but he was weak. He, he didn't stand up for what he appeared to believe in. Most importantly and disastrously, he didn't mobilize his base to ensure that things happened. You know, he was elected on a vast tide of popular sentiment. Um, people looking for sweeping radical change in the US. Not only did he fail to deliver it, uh, he, he abandoned those people as soon as he was in office. And as a result, he couldn't mobilize their power to push policy past a recalcitrant Congress. Um, and, and as a result, the fossil fuel interests dominated and won. So while I understand those forces, I don't think that Obama and Merkel, whatever their many virtues may be, can really position themselves as leaders on, on this issue. It, it's the people who haven't compromised, who haven't succumbed, who haven't been bullied and pushed around by fossil fuel interests or in Merkel's case, the motor industry, which she seems all too willing to appease when she was in office. Um, those are the people who retain their moral authority, retain their credibility. It's the young people leading the climate protests, leading the alternatives to the summit, who we should be listening to. And what about Britain? I mean, obviously there's, there's the issue that it's hosting this COP. So in, in a sense, it is leading because it's, it's the host nation. It's the most sort of uh, politically visible country when it comes to how, how the media covers it. But more, more broadly, we're hearing this idea of Britain as a climate leader, and that's preceded the last several weeks. We've heard it for years now. 
Where does Britain figure as a sort of climate culprit? Well, you know, Britain was for a very long time the biggest of the colonial nations, which ripped apart many other countries in looting them for their land, their labour, their resources, including fossil fuels. Um, obviously, Britain's oil politics in the Middle East created conflicts, some of which are still running today. Um, it then used, um, following apparent decolonization, a whole series of means to ensure that it retained control effectively of many of the parts of the world which were previously its colonies, either um, a, a precipitating coups and then um, having installed governments, arming them and in, ensuring that they um, uh, suppress movements um, requesting meaningful independence and decolonization, using international debt and structural adjustment, using all these devious corporate practices like transfer pricing, where you effectively take resources for nothing um, without paying tax, um, uh, uh, still retaining control over many parts of the world in order to grab natural wealth from those places. And now having wreaked such enormous damage and immiserated so many people around the world. We now dump our waste products in the form of carbon dioxide and indeed many other waste products on the very same people who suffer those impacts far more severely than we do because partly because of their extreme poverty created um, in large part by colonialism um, partly because of accidents of geography that um, rich nations like the UK, most of them are in temperate areas, so tropical regions of the world which are being hit hardest in, in many cases. Um, and so we see this sort of colonial debt building to extraordinary existential scales, you know, that were we to pay reparations for everything we stole, during the colonial period, they would exceed by many times all the, all the money on earth today. Were we to pay reparations for the loss and damage we're now causing through climate breakdown, well, you would say the same. Um, no money can compensate for what people are now suffering. So for Boris Johnson to stand up at the beginning of the COP conference and say, we can be like James Bond. In other words, we can be a white saviour who comes along in his flash car and saves the world from whoever the villain might be, who generally is some foreigner, because that's how it normally is in James Bond. Um, and that we have, we have the ideas, he said. Um, we have the banks um, positioning the very people and processes which have caused this catastrophe as the saviours. That's some cheek. There's talk about Britain's leadership role being based upon the fact that it's reduced its emissions so substantially, and we can discuss whether that's 45% or 15%, but what's clear is that it, it, it's lower than it was in 1990. And even if you include things like aviation and manufactured goods, it's still lower than some like the United States or, or Canada or Australia. But the more I listen to people here at COP, and the more I learn about, for instance, the role of the City of London in financing fossil fuel projects, I still wonder if maybe Britain is the number one climate bad guy. Mm. And do we need to think about that label, whether it's the US, whether it's the UK, the climate bad guys? The fact that's now looked through the lens purely of CO2 emissions, is that, is that kind of mis misguided? Yeah, um, well, this is, this is a crucial, very important question. Um, British finance, directly and indirectly, exerts a massive and disproportionate impact around the world. I mean, you know, people find it very convenient to point to China or India and say they're the problem, and they, because they're building these these coal-powered uh, coal-fired power stations. Look at this, uh, aren't they awful? They say, yeah, who's paying for those? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so so you finance the construction of these power stations, and then you complain that the the power stations are being constructed. Look at China, isn't it terrible producing all those consumer goods? Yeah, well, who's, who's buying the consumer goods? Um, 
and and we use i mean china in particular is used as a way of deflecting blame for all sorts of things i mean not just for climate you know or, you know you want you want good employment rights in this country look at china you can't have them otherwise we'll be outcompeted by china and and it's been sort of cited as this um as this bogeyman for 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 well over a century for all the things you don't want to do or you do want to do, uh, you could you can blame China for it, and and so that that discourse has continued. But when you look, as you say, at the role of the City of London and how it sits at the centre of a web of tax havens and secrecy regimes around the world, processing the proceeds of organised crime, of corruption, um, of, of kleptocracy, um, in other countries. I mean, obviously, because so much of it is secret, so much of it is very well hidden through a whole series of shell companies and opaque transactions. Some of it comes up from time to time in leaks of papers like the Paradise Papers, Pandora Papers, the Panama Papers, showing, you know, giving us a hint of what's been happening. You begin to wonder, yeah, maybe this could still be the greatest destructive force on Earth. Um, uh, it, it, I mean, it is extraordinary that we we don't see this, but we're basically sitting on the proceeds of organised crime here. Um, um, I mean, the City of London collectively could be seen as a sort of giant crime syndicate in that it is processing stolen money, laundered money from around the world. Um, people say, oh, you know, look at the corruption in the global south. You can't, cor corruption can't succeed unless you can shift the money somewhere. Mm. And, and unless you've got somewhere to take it, somewhere to put it, somewhere to hide it. And that's the service that the City of London offers. Now, of course, corruption is also facilitated by our multinationals wanting resources, paying bribes, doing deals, very often without any transparency at all, obviously. Um, our government's backing them up, and we've seen several scandals now where the UK government has been working with private corporations on, to secure corrupt deals abroad. Yeah. And, but above all, we have the City of London and its institutions processing the money arising from that and helping people to make that money disappear from public view, um, to channel it through tax havens, through secrecy regimes. Um, and you know, we, yeah, we see the results in those leaked papers. But you put all that together and you think, hang on a moment, you're, you're blaming corruption on other nations, you know, we're the engine room of corruption. The hypocrisy point for me is really interesting because if you just go even just slightly beneath the surface <clears throat> on any sort of policy announcements or, you know, political positions being adopted, you, you recognise immediately the extent of the hypocrisy, not just historical, but ongoing. A great example is the European nations and the EU saying to South America, Brazil, you know, we need to end deforestation. But at the same time, they're signing trade agreements whereby they're increasing their beef imports from Brazil, which of course is a major reason for why we have deforestation. I mean, it's a question for you because you know the activists, you see the politicians, you've been familiar with this for decades. I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, the common person, if they were in receipt of the facts and knew that and then saw how these politicians present themselves would say, you're either a pathological liar or you're deeply unintelligent. So, so what explains this profound hypocrisy? Because it's not some one-off, it's, it's, it's at the core way of how climate politics operates from the global north. There's an entire worldview at stake here. I mean, th these are people who have convinced themselves that the market will sol solve all our problems, the invisible hand of the market. Uh, it, it's a belief in magic, you know, you know that, that you know, things, things will only go right if government steps out of the way and leaves it to these mysterious market forces. Now, it's not entirely surprising that people in that position believe in magic because they were brought up surrounded by it. You know, food magically appeared in front of them on the table. They'd throw their clothes on the floor and they'd magically reappear in the wardrobe, washed and ironed. Uh, their beds would get made. The, the house would clean itself. You know, how does this happen? Isn't it amazing? It amazes. You know, and so you can sort of see how that sort of detachment from the reality of, of labour, the reality of life, um, can easily bleed into a system of magical thinking which tells you, you know, any attempted agency is the problem. 
Whereas leaving it to this mysterious force called the market, that is a solution. This is a fundamental neoliberal idea. But this mysterious force called the market isn't actually very mysterious at all when you actually say, what is this and what's going on? It's the power of money. And the power of money means it's the power of the people who've got the money. And so what you're effectively doing is transferring power from the democratic sphere into the plutocratic sphere. And you're saying, um, you, the rich people, can decide what happens. And we're going to step back and leave it to you. We're going to deregulate. We're going to remove taxes. We're going to hobble the trade unions um, and the NGOs, anyone who might pose any impediment to you, um, to your power to decide. Democracy must be pushed back so that um, the power of money can, can speak instead. And inevitably, of course, um, whether that power is felt through the privatization of public services, um, through the deregulation um, environmentally or in terms of protecting workers, protecting tenants. I think Grenfell Tower is a classic example of the, the result of deregulation, um, uh, protecting consumers, whatever it might be. What that means is that rich people can do bad things to us. And, and so what we see through the trade agreements in particular is the distillation of rich people doing bad things to us. Um, they are absolutely infused with corporate lobby groups. Um, um, government um, has given itself this excuse to stand back and let them, in effect, write those trade agreements because government should stand back. You know, government is illegitimate. Government should get out of the way. The self-hating state is always prepared to yield ground to the power of money, partly out of sort of post-rational justifications, um, but partly because you know, some of these people really do believe this stuff. They, they really do believe in, in this magic, this mm. invisible hand which will sort everything out. It's a convenient belief, obviously, mm. but that's not to say it's not always a genuine belief. Um, and, and, so, and, and so with the trade agreements, we get agreements which obviously are cast for the needs of the people who are making them, who are, are very much dominated by the corporate lobbies. And the classic example of this, where climate breakdown is concerned, is the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, and at the moment, as we speak, a British oil company is suing the Italian government because the Italian government has decided it doesn't want oil drilling in coastal waters. And that, um, according to the terms of the Energy Charter Treaty, means that the company has lost what are called its future anticipated profits. Not any money it's actually got, not any investment it's actually made, but it might have been wanting to drill in those coastal waters and therefore it might have made X amount of money, assuming no other reason was stopping it, like people not wanting the oil anymore or anything like that. It's all theoretical, but there's a theoretical $5 billion or something that we could have made you must now pay us $5 billion. And under the terms of the Energy Charter Treaty, yeah, Italy is obliged to pay that money. And so this treaty, this trade treaty, effectively prevents change. It locks in fossil fuels. It ensures that governments can't do what their people want and what the world needs, and making that energy transition is an absolute scandal. And everyone should know about it, but most people don't. Do these companies need to be shut down? and wound up. So Shell, BP, various energy giants in, in Europe, North America, Petrobras, China. But I mean, you know, the, it seems that you, you increasingly hear smart arguments from people saying, well, actually, we don't need to do that. Actually, that would be counterproductive. And I, I think perhaps we're a bit past the well actually. I mean, if we can't dig up fossil fuels from the ground anymore, it seems strange that these companies should continue to be allowed to make profits. So, so what should we do with them? Well, when you look at the efforts that they make to try to legitimise themselves, you know, the huge amount of money they're now pouring into adverts, to memes, to social media work, um, to lobbying, obviously, political lobbying, it's very clear that they have seen the writing on the wall. You know, they, they know that they have no more legitimate presence in, 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 in our economy, let alone in our politics. Um, and so they're desperately trying to reposition themselves as clean energy companies. 
And you know, the, in Europe at any rate, it's not quite the same in the US, but in Europe, almost all the ads are about their investments in green energy or clean energy. An analysis by the International Energy Agency found that only 1% of their investments are actually in clean energy of the oil majors. Uh, unsurprising, you know, they're oil companies. Um, and so, and, and in fact, you begin to wonder, would they have made any of those investments if it weren't for the fact that they have to have something to talk about? Mm. You know, I, I think they're token investments, they're just there for everything else to hide behind. So I, I don't believe they, they, their existence is still legitimate. I think they should be shut down. Um, and of course, you know, they're frantically, you know, they, they recognize that a lot of people think that and they're frantically lobbying to prevent that from happening, which is why of the ones we know, there are 500 fossil fuel delegates at the climate conference at the moment, far more than um, delegations from a whole host of countries. In fact, that would be the biggest delegation from any country if they were a country. But those are just the ones we know about. There's a whole lot of people with pink badges, which means they're non-affiliated. And from what we can deduce, it seems quite a lot of those are actually fossil fuel um, uh, companies, but they're not giving away their affiliations. Um, so it's, it's thick with them. Mm. And, and it's thick with them because their survival is on the line at the moment. So there are lots of bad guys in the climate debate, billionaires, multinationals. Um, some would include the media, in terms of inaction especially. Mm. If someone were to ask me which industry is more responsible for continuing climate breakdown, the fossil fuel industry or the media, I would say the media. Because the media grants a social license to the fossil fuel industries to continue to operate. Without that social license, they would not be able to survive. They would have been closed down years ago. But by constantly generating arguments in their favour, by constantly tilting the, the weight of reporting towards what they want to see rather than what the planet needs, the media has permitted their existence, but not just the fossil fuel companies, all the rest of the infrastructure as well, all the fossil fuel infrastructure, the, the, the cars and the roads and the flights and um, the power stations, uh, most of the media, most of the time has resisted every step of the way attempts to escape from this death spiral that, that we're on um, and, and has constantly attacked and undermined people who are trying to create this transition, um, has, has mocked and, and denied and, um, and, and delayed. It's done everything possible to prevent the change we need. And so, yeah, I would put the media top of my list of climate villains. I say that as a journalist. And is it possible to get meaningful action on climate change until we have media reform, given they're the number one bad guy? I think our best hope now is a great proliferation of alternatives just like this one. And we're beginning to see that. We're beginning to see very large numbers, particularly of young people, turning away from the mainstream media turning away completely from the billionaire press because they've rumbled it. They've seen that, oh yeah, the billionaire press is owned by billionaires. They've got particular interests. And turning towards outlets like this and many others, you know, Byline Double Down, um, we're even doing a, a, a two week thing for, for the climate talks called um, COP26.TV, a whole load of outlets like this, which have become extremely popular and, and present I think and I hope eventually a mortal challenge to the mainstream media, which just looks more and more ridiculous as time goes by. And as a smaller and smaller core readership, um, mostly composed of people who don't want change, who are very afraid of anything changing. But vast numbers of people have rumbled them now. And, and I think things are going to shift pretty rapidly. Why is the media so bad at reporting climate change in the last couple of years. It's visibly different to me, the climate movement. You know, three, four years ago, the pinnacle of the climate movement was the polar bear. Now it's indigenous rights movements uh, and people talk about land reform in really smart ways. But media coverage seems the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so why is that? So the BBC is finally making the climate programmes it should have made 20 years ago. But it's still not making the climate programmes it should be making today. 
you know, there's, there's this sort of desperate scramble to catch up after this almost complete void of, of coverage. And I mentioned the BBC because you might expect better from the BBC than you would from the Murdoch Empire, but really it's scarcely been better at all. In fact, for a very long time, um, I roughly date it, 1995 to 2018, it was actively hostile towards environmental proposals. I mean, producers I, I tried to work with, you know, were, were told to F off. You know, they were just, they, they, they were sworn out of the room by these furious channel controllers. So one guy I worked with um, took a proposal that we'd worked on for months for, for, for an environmental series to the then controller of BBC Two. And the guy looks at the headline, that's all he looks at, the title of it, he says, is this environment? And the producer says, yes. He said, I've been trying to get environment off this channel for the past two years. Why the fuck are you bringing me environment? And, and that was in 1995, and it just carried on that way. Um, uh, and, and the specialist environmental filmmakers, I knew every one of them went bust. They all had to close down or start making reality shows, game shows and stuff instead, because they could not survive making environmental programs because it was the, the hostility was intense. It was considered counter aspirational. No one wants to see this rubbish. You know, I was told all that. Channel Four went one step further. They did the same thing, rejecting out of hand, just just without even looking at them, all environmental proposals, just about all of them, except the ones denying that there was an issue. So they commissioned a series called Against Nature and a massive film called The Great Global Warming Swindle, basically saying it's all a pack of lies, none of it's happening. Um, here are some very eminent scientists um, of, uh, sponsored by the fossil fuel industry who um, will tell you that it is, it is all complete nonsense, there's nothing to worry about. And those had a massive impact, you know, because people, they don't expect public sector broadcasters to outright lie to you. Channel 4 outright lied to us and did enormous harm. They set back the cause by years. And BBC set back the cause too. Yeah, I mean, it, by, by the slant of what it was doing. So um, David Attenborough made a um, film called The Truth About Climate Change. Um, and in it, he didn't mention the fossil fuel companies at all, except as the solution to, 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 to climate breakdown, because what was then called the Norwegian company Statoil, um, look, it's, it's doing carbon capture and storage, it's burying the carbon emissions, which mysteriously, I don't know where they came from, but they're these carbon, this carbon dioxide, and it's burying carbon dioxide. Isn't that big of it? Isn't that so great that Statoil is not a word about where the fossil fuel emissions were coming from in the first place, who was producing them or anything. The only factor he named as causing climate breakdown was the Chinese and he spoke specifically about the Chinese consumer. And that instantly triggered this massive new wave of denial. It's not us, it's the Chinese. You know, what's the point of us doing anything at all when the Chinese are building a coal-fired power station every two seconds or whatever bullshit statistic they came up with? And, and that did more harm to efforts to, to um, to actually address the climate crisis and almost anything I've seen in, in the whole 36 years that I've been working in this field, a David Attenborough programme, set back those efforts. So what was going on at the BBC? Well, what was going on is that they were deeply afraid of rocking the boat. They did not want to challenge the status quo and there is nothing more status quo than fossil fuels and the industries which profit from them. We can talk about the Murdoch stuff. Everyone knows about the Murdoch stuff. Everyone knows that the billionaire press is fundamentally corrupt because, oh yes, it's owned by billionaires. That's the fundamental problem. And billionaires are at the heart of climate breakdown. They have enormous carbon footprints, their huge investments, their interests in all these destructive industries. Yeah, so the billionaire press is obviously going to be a force which drives us towards catastrophe. But in some ways, the role of the public sector broadcasters is even worse. I would put the BBC at the top of my list of climate villains within the media.